for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Tuesday afternoon, June the 22nd, 1982. Family camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campground, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Frank Hammond is the teacher of the afternoon. This is tape one of a series of two services, three tapes, on the mind and the emotions. This tape is entitled, The Mind. Now, I want to begin to lay some groundwork for personal deliverance. We were talking last night about spiritual warfare and how important that is to bind the strong man. You first bind the strong man, and then you spoil his house. Now, we need to understand some very basic things about ourselves. Because as we understand about ourselves, then we begin to understand how evil spirits are able to work their way into our lives. We are, according to 1 Thessalonians 5 and other places in the Scripture, we are tripart beings. You need to understand this about yourself. You are body, you are soul, and you are spirit. Now, all three of those factors make up the total man. Now, we have to operate as total men. God wants us to function as total men. You know, you can't really totally separate your soul from your body or your body from your spirit because it all works together. It works in conjunction. But for the sake of teaching, for the sake of analysis, we can dissect ourselves and, and look and examine the body, the soul, and the spirit. You see, when a person is born again, that is a spiritual experience. And a person's spirit, which has been dead in trespasses and sin up to that point, is quickened. The word quickened means to make alive. So when you are born again, you are transformed from a condition of spiritual deadness to a condition of spiritual life. Now, that has affected one part of your being. That has affected your spirit man. Now, there are two other parts of your being that need attention. Your physical man and your soulish man also need attention. But the change has to take place, first of all, in your spirit man before the change can take place in the natural man, the physical man, and in the soulish man. Now, we have to understand the difference between body, soul, and spirit. Because since we have been born again, and since we have been baptized in God's Holy Spirit, we have been given spiritual life, and we have been given spiritual power. That simply means that now we are in a condition to function as spiritual men. We don't have to function on the level of the natural anymore, but we can function on the level of the supernatural. Now, here is where uh, Brother... David's teaching this morning really comes into focus. Wonderful teaching, blessed teaching, to help us to understand the operation of the spirit man and what we can do functioning as individual members in the body of Christ through the empowerment of God's Holy Spirit to have a supernatural ministry. You see, if you don't operate in a spiritual, supernatural ministry, you will operate on a subnormal basis. You will operate as natural men. You will ap operate as the physical man. Now, the physical man and the soulish man are important to the total functioning of the spiritual man. When pa the Apostle Paul went on missionary journeys, he didn't send his spirit out to the mission field. That spirit that was in him went in his physical body, and his soulish man, his mind and emotions and, a will, and will, were very much involved in his missionary work. But the difference is, and what I want you to see and appreciate today is, that as a person made up of body, soul, and spirit, if you're to be a spiritual person and function as a spiritual person, the spirit man in you must be the ruler in your life. The spirit in you must be submitted and controlled and led by God's Holy Spirit. And when the spirit man in you is king, he is ruler in your life, then you can function as a spirit man. Now, if a person functions out of the soulish realm, 
which embraces his mind, his emotions, and his will, then he becomes a soulish Christian. The soul is leading. For example, if a person has put a lot of emphasis upon learning and upon the quickening of the mind and the uh, building up of the intellect, then that person is more than likely to function on a soulish level with his mind leading rather than his spirit leading in what he does. See, I went to a Baptist seminary years ago, spent three years there, and most of the emphasis in my seminary training was for the development of my mind for the development of knowledge, for the acquiring of information that would help me to pastor a church. They gave me all of the things that I needed to function from my mind. And so what happened? When I went out and began my ministry, it was a soulish ministry. It was a ministry that was based upon the operation of what my mind had received. And so I was doing those things which were logical and those things which were intellectual rather than those things which are spiritual. Well, you can't have much of a Holy Ghost service under those conditions. The Holy Ghost wasn't moving. There was no ministry. There was no miracles. There was no supernatural ministry of the Lord. Now, this is what God wants to bring us all out of, the operation of the soulish man, so that the spiritual man will be the king in our life, and he will be leading and directing in all of the things that we do. If the physical man is leading, that's what the Bible calls a carnal Christian. David was teaching out of 1 Corinthians, if you go on right into the second chapter there. He goes on and he talks about, Paul says, well, I'd like to talk to you as being spiritual, but I can't because you're still carnal. There's envying and strife and all of that among you. And he says, you're yet babes in Christ. See, when you come into the things of the Lord, you don't come in full grown. You are born into the kingdom of God, but you're a baby. And you have to grow and you have to be nourished and fed and grow up in the things and the ways of the Lord. Now... The devil knows, the devil knows that if you function by the power and the leading of the Spirit, then he's in for trouble. He knows that if you let the Spirit man in you be king, then he can't get you to do what he wants you to do. He can't subvert your spiritual life, and he can't subvert your spiritual ministry unto the Lord. So guess what? The devil knowing that, He does everything he can to believers to promote the soulish man in him to rise up and to take authority. You see, I find a lot of Christians who haven't even learned the difference between their soul and their spirit. They they have never really identified the spirit man within them. Well, if they don't even know and recognize the spirit man, how in the world are they going to be able to function as spirit man? You have to develop where you can hear God. See, when God speaks, God is spirit. And he speaks to you spirit to spirit. He doesn't speak directly to your mind. He speaks to your spirit. Your mind has to pick up what is being related to you by God in your spirit. And your mind then begins to understand so that it can convey to others the things that you have received from God who is spirit by the operation of God's spirit upon your own spirit. See, some people operate by feeling. You know, they get electricity and all sorts of things running all over their body, and they get it all into the realm of feeling. Well, praise God, there's a lot of feeling that goes along with the moving of God's Spirit. But the moving of God's Spirit is not feeling. There may be feeling that goes along with it, but you've got to learn the difference or you'll begin to operate in the flesh and you'll begin to promote those things which are of feeling rather than those things which are of the Spirit of God. So here the devil comes along and he wants to put the soulish man on the throne. So you will be leading by your mind and by your emotions and by your own will rather than being led by the operation of God's Holy Spirit. Now, he wants to promote the physical man. He wants to put the, the body man. He wants to put him upon the throne because he knows that if he does that, then the spirit man again cannot function and cannot minister as he ought. Now, what I want to, to, to begin this afternoon will be a series of teachings followed by deliverance that we may deal with these separate areas in our lives to put down that which is the hindrance to the spiritual man. I want to deal with the mind today. I think that's a good place to start. Somebody said it's all in your head. Well, (laughs) it may not be all in your head, but a lot of it is in our heads. A lot of our problems are in our minds. I've come to this decision and this conclusion 
that many of our problems are caused by problems in our minds, and these problems in our mind have gotten less attention than most other problems that we try to deal with. It's sometimes one of the last things that we actually see. Look with me in Proverbs chapter 4, in Proverbs 4 beginning in verse 20. My son, attend unto my words, and incline thine ears to my sayings. He's saying, be teachable. Open up your heart and mind to the things of the Spirit of God. Let them not depart from thine eye. Well, keep these plaques before the Word the word of God. That's one of the things that's authorized to hang on your wall. You're hard-pressed to find any authorization to put anything on the walls of your house other than the Scripture plaques as far as the Word of God. Hang them on your doorposts. Look at them when you're coming in and going out and all the rest of it. All right, keep the Word of God and the precepts of God before your eyes and keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep my heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Now, you have to keep your heart. You have to guard your mind. You have to guard your spirit, man. All of these. Because your heart, or we might say your spirit, is like unto a womb. He said, out of your heart come the issues of life. When a baby is born, it is considered an issue, an issue of life that comes out of the mother's womb. Now, before that child can be born, there has to be a conception. And when the conception comes forth, then there is a period of time, and finally there comes forth the birth, and there comes forth the issue. God says, be careful what enters into you, because a conception is taking place, and according to what is conceived, then that thing is going to come out of you. Protect yourself, protect your heart, and then protect your mind, because your mind is a field also where things are conceived. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so what we think upon, what we receive in ourselves, eventually we're going to have to live with the results of that. Now I want to start out by giving you six basic facts concerning your mind. Six basic facts concerning your mind. The first fact is that the mind is not instantly renewed at the moment of conversion. Your mind is not instantly renewed at the moment of conversion. See, we said a moment ago that when you are born again, that is a spiritual experience. Your mind is a part of the soulish man, and it is not directly affected to what happens to you when you experience the new birth. But there has been a change, there has been a quickening and a making alive of the spirit man within you. Paul was talking to Christians in when he wrote Romans chapter 12, the first couple of verses, Be not conformed unto this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, if they had gotten it all when they got saved, they would need for their minds to be renewed, would they? You know, some people have been saved for a long time. Does that mean just because you get saved, you don't have any more problems with your mind? Mind's never disturbed, mind's never distraught, mind's never bound up, never become forgetful, never have any more problems with your mind. Once that you are saved, that's not true. You know that's not true. And yet you know you're genuinely saved. You know that you're genuinely born again. You go around and say, oh, what's the matter with me? I thought I was saved. I'm still having trouble with my mind. That's because that there is a process by which the mind now has to be dealt with. Be ye renewed in your mind. So God wants the mind renewed. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, does this mean that we have to work to get saved? No, that's not what he's saying. It's not by works of righteousness that we have done, because our righteousness is like filthy rags. He's saying that once you have been born again, the Spirit of God is at work in you, for it is God who worketh in you. So God has implanted himself in you, quickened and made alive your spirit man, and now he wants to work on the rest of you. You know, we're like a temple. The scripture says that we're temples. Well, there were three parts to the temple. There was an outer court, there was a holy place, and there was a holy of holies. When the temple was erected, God's presence and glory came into that temple. Where into that temple did his presence reside? In the holy of holies. 
Did that mean that God was not interested in the holy place and the outer court? Not at all. He expected his presence in there to influence and permeate everything else that was being done within that temple. Saints, the same thing is true in my life and your life. When we are born again, God indwells us as temples of the living God. God's presence, God's spirit indwells you as a believer. Indwells your spirit man, quickens and makes alive your spirit man. But the soulish man needs to be influenced by the presence of God within your spirit. Within your newly alive spirit, God wants to permeate and affect the other things that are done within your life. He wants to rule over your mind. God wants to be king and authority over your mind. So he says, work out your own salvation. Thayer's Greek lexicon says the word salvation there. The first principal definition of the word given in the Greek lexicon is deliverance from the molestation of enemies. All right, you read that definition into the meaning of salvation, and it says, work out your own deliverance from the molestation of enemies, for it is God who worketh in you. Hallelujah. God's Spirit is within you, therefore you drive out all of the unclean things from the outer courts of the temple. Like Jesus cleansed the temple and drove out every defiling, contaminating thing out of that temple, everything that shouldn't be there, he drove it out, cast it out. Well, we're to cast it out. Everything that is not of God, that's in our soulish man, that's in our physical man, those things are to be purged out to work out your own salvation, deliver yourself from all of the powers of those things that would move into your life. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, he says, Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. See, when you get born again, you're just a little baby, and you have to grow up in the things and the ways of the Lord. All right, here's the second fact concerning your mind. The mind will rule if you let it. The mind will rule if you permit it to rule. That's the reason Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that we have to deal with our minds bringing every thought into captivity and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. God is spirit and he communicates with us in our human spirit. And God will speak to our spirit. And then we receive that instruction. So we have to walk and we have to live as spirit men so that the spirit of God can communicate with us. The mind is not capable of hearing God speak directly. But it wants to come to the throne and it wants to exalt itself and it wants to put into operation the things that it has and offer the things that it can in place of the operation of the spirit man within us. You see the importance of ruling over the mind and not letting it rule the life, but let the spirit man? You know, the, the, the mind is a lot like the tongue. James says that it's an unruly member, and it causes a lot of trouble. Say so the same thing is true about my mind and your mind. It is an unruly member of our body until our mind is completely disciplined. The third fact about your mind is this that it is a priority target for the devil. Satan's objective is to live your life for you. See, again, he is the counterfeiter. He wants to do it. God wants to live your life for you. To lose your life is to gain it. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. It is no longer I that live, but it is Christ who liveth and dwelleth within me. He's living by the presence and by the leading of the Spirit of God in his life. Now, the mind will want to come forward, and the devil will want to take advantage of the operation of the mind, and it is a priority target of the devil. The devil wants to control you. He wants to control your life. He wants to manipulate your life. Now, how is he going to do it? See, eventually, he has to get to your will. You have to be in agreement with what Satan wants you to do, and you have to make a decision, well, that's what I'm going to do. But he can't begin with your will. He has to work his way in. He has to worm his way into your life. So where does he begin? In your thoughts. You know, sometimes we have thoughts that pop into our minds that are all just plain embarrassing. Just plain embarrassing. You're so glad that there's not a window up here in your forehead with a little thing running across the screen up there so everybody can read all the thoughts that go on in your mind. Because there's some of those things you're just plain ashamed of. 
They're just not in the ways of God. You say, well, where did that thing come from? Man, I don't want some kind of a thought like that. Well, see, it didn't come from you. It sure didn't come from God. Well, where did it come from? It came from Satan. See, those are those darts. Those are some of those fiery darts that the devil throws. See, he'll throw things into your mind. See, if he can get your mind to latch on to those things. And you get the, your mind latched onto those things, and the mind gets all caught up in that, and then the warfare is on. Because the devil knows that if he can get you to thinking about something, then it's not long after that that he can control your emotions and control your decision. Suppose, for example, somebody hurts you. Now, somebody's always doing that. You, have you ever figured out that it would be so easy to be spiritual if it weren't, weren't for other people? If we just didn't have to relate to other people. Most of the problems we have are people-related problems. They, they're just stirring up something and causing some stink and creating some pressure on me. Well, the devil knows that there are people who offend us. Now, the Bible tells us what to do if we're offended. We just forgive. Isn't that simple? All you've got to do anytime you're offended, just forgive and love the person who has offended you. Bless them in the name of Jesus. That's God's instruction. But see, the devil puts something else in your mind. Well, you can't let them get by with that. After all, you owe it to yourself to retaliate. You're going to have to stand up for your rights. See, he tells you a lot of things that sound sensible to you and sound logical to you, but are totally anti-scriptural. And so he'll say, okay, it was Mary Sue, say, that hurt you. All right, so in your mind comes Mary Sue's name. And you just see her face. And you just see that look on her face when she said that hurtful thing to you. And so Mary Sue, just like a broken record going over in your mind. Mary Sue, Mary Sue, Mary Sue, Mary Sue. All right? When that thing keeps going over in your mind and her name is ever on your mind and you're conscious of her day in and day out, night in and night out, then what happens to your emotions? See, your emotions begin to get caught up in that. And you begin to feel resentment. You begin to feel bitterness. You begin to feel emotions of hatred in you. And you see it began in your mind first? Began in your mind. See, if you dealt with it in your mind, it never would have gotten into your emotions. But you let the devil go ahead and put those things and you begin to agree with what he was putting into your mind. And so it's gotten into your emotions. Now, the devil knows that if he can get your emotions stirred up enough, he can control your actions. He knows that if he can get you emotionally depressed, he can make you want to die and even attempt to take your own life. Because he comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. He knows that if he can get your emotions stirred up in hatred and resentment and bitterness of somebody else, that you're going to sin with your mouth. That you're going to maybe sock them in the nose when they come around. So he wants to control your life. He wants to control your activities, but he makes the mind a primary target. That is a battlefield. Most of us are aware of the battle that's daily going on within our minds. So we have to bring every thought into captivity and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Anything that comes to our mind that is contrary to the teaching of God's Word, you've got to reject but. Learn where your reject button is. And push the reject button till choo, that thing goes out of your mind. You don't just keep on thinking about something that's ministering something spiritually negative to you. That was one of the most glorious revelations that ever came to me. Soon after I got the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I found out that I could do something about those thoughts that kept harassing me in my mind, filling me with fear and doubt and a lot of other negative things. And I finally found out I had a reject button. All I had to do was push that button, choop, and that thing was gone. All right, here's another fact concerning your mind. Number four, the mind is naturally carnal. It is carnal until it's made spiritual, until it's renewed. Now, we decide whether our mind is going to be natural and carnal or whether it's going to be spiritual. It says in Romans 8, 5, They that are after the Spirit do mind the things of the Spirit. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. See, you're going to become whatever you occupy your mind with. If your mind is occupied with natural things, with carnal things, then you become a carnal person. Your mind has become carnal, and you become carnal in your life. But on the contrary, if you put your mind on the things of the Spirit of God, 
then you become a spiritual person. So there is the need for the mind to be renewed and to be brought into subjection to the spirit man because naturally it is a carnal mind. And the carnal mind, when it begins to lead, can get you into all kinds of problems. You know, you can create things that come through the operation of the carnal mind that you have to live with. Now, some of us are having to live with some of the things that we have done in time past. There's a spiritual law that's called the law of sowing and reaping. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Now, if you sow to the flesh, it says you will reap corruption. So you're going to have to live with whatever kind of seed you sow. So that ought to make us careful about what we sow, shouldn't it? Make us very, very cautious about the kind of seed that we sow. See, Abraham and Sarah, one time, they'd been given a wonderful promise in God. They were just to believe God for the son of promise. But you see, there was a time process. That's when the holding of faith comes into focus. Where you have to stand. And having done all, keep on standing. Because God promised. But see, Sarah began to get into the operation of the mind. And she looked at herself and looked at Abraham and said, Well, we can't have a baby. Not at our age. That's impossible. So Abraham, the only way we can have a child is for you to take Hagar. You know, there's no indication that Abraham prayed over that suggestion. Evidently, Hagar was a pretty good-looking gal. And when Sarah made that suggestion, he said, Yeah, that's what we'll do. We'll have a child by Hagar. So he had a child by Hagar. Ishmael was born. But Ishmael was born of the flesh. And that which is flesh is flesh. And Abraham cried out and he said, Oh God, bless Ishmael. Use him. Let him be the son of promise. Uh Uh-uh, God said. No, we can't use that because that's of the flesh. You see, that's an illustration of how we can get in the operation of the mind and we can do those things which are of the flesh and then we have to live with that. Do you know the Jews and the the descendants of, of Esau are still fighting over there today? They're still fighting over there, the product of the flesh and those things that came through, through the fleshly man. All right, here's another principle pertaining to your mind. The carnal mind leads to death. The carnal mind leads to death. The spirit man leads to life. That's the reason the carnal mind must be renewed. You see, there are a lot of people who are alive even spiritually. They're spiritually alive. They've been born again, but they are actually living in death. Can you see what I'm saying by that? That There is no spiritual fruit out of their life because they're living under the power and influence of the soulish man. All right? If a man minds the things of the carnal nature, he cannot know the ways of God. And he will never find out the true values of life. You know, the scripture says that when we have Christ, we have a foundation. Now, that foundation is is adequate. You know, if you want to build a spiritual skyscraper on it, you can build a spiritual skyscraper. But also, you can take that same foundation and you can build a chicken cup on it. And some people have Jesus Christ as their spiritual foundation, and then they have built a house of wood, hay, and stubble. And the time of judgment will come, and all of that will be destroyed, and they will be saved, though as by fire. Everything that has been in their life since the time they have been saved is wood, hay, and stubble and the judgment of God consumes it. They're saved, but they get in by the skin of their teeth. They do not earn and receive spiritual reward. So the end result of that is death. Now, one other principle concerning our minds is we are responsible for controlling our mind. Now, we do that by the Spirit's help. You know, forever there are people coming to me And they say, well, Brother Frank, I just can't get the victory. I said, you can? Oh, Brother Frank, you just don't understand. You don't understand the problem that I have. Brother Frank, I'm just too weak. Brother Frank, you said that I've got to stand up and I've got to enter into a spiritual battle. And by the way, I say that to each one of you in this auditorium today. You must take a stand. Somebody else always wanting somebody else to fight their battle for me. Brother Frank, won't you cast those devils out? Won't you get rid of those things? Like, I don't have to do anything if you do it for me. God wants you to take a stand. He didn't say just for the minister to take a stand. He said for you to take a stand. Now, you can do it. People say, oh, I just can't. See, I had a man come to me a while back, and he was having real problems with manic depression. You know, one time, he could just be way up there on the mountaintop. 
Everything was glorious. He was singing. He was praising God. He was rejoicing. Five minutes later, you had to try to scrape him off the sidewalk. I mean, he had just gone from one extreme to the other. And I administered deliverance to him. And then I began to tell him, I said, you have power in yourself to control those mood swings within you. You can do it. You can do it. You can keep from falling into that hole of depression. When you sense that thing moving in on you, you've got to start praising God. And he got upset with me. He said, now, Brother Frank, I can't do that. I, I, he said, don't you understand that some people are just weak? And he said, I'm one of those persons, I'm just weak. I can't help it. I can't help from falling into depression. I said, well, you never will get out of depression until you learn to take a stand against it and start praising God when that thing tries to move in on you. Well, I, I, was, I sounded like the old broken record to him. I just kept telling him that over and over again. And I'd watch him on the roller coaster, you know, up and down, up and down. And one day, I told him that thing, I don't know how many times, one day he was off doing something and that depression started moving on. He came home from work that night and he said, Brother Frank, guess what? That thing worked. You told me I could have authority over that thing and I decided I'd try it. When that thing started moving in on me, I just started rejoicing and praising God and praying in tongues and he said, that thing didn't take me over like it used to. Oh, glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We do have a thought. Why? Because of the Spirit of God who lives within us. We can't say, I can't. God doesn't accept that as an excuse. We must say, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. The same Spirit, saints, that raised Christ from the dead dwells in your mortal body. The resurrected power of the Lord Jesus Christ indwells every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And who are you to say, I can't control my mind when the Spirit of God is resident within you? You can control your mind and you must control your mind. That is the word of the Lord. We have responsibility for the control and correction of our minds. Now, we have to discipline our minds. We have to keep all the wrong thoughts out. We have to redirect our mind. When our mind starts down the wrong trail, get it off of that trail and get it back on the right path. We have to train our minds in the things of the Spirit of God. Your goal for your mind is to have the mind of Christ. That's your goal. And that's your objective. Now let me give you seven steps in the discipline of your mind. Directed thinking for your mind. In Philippians chapter 4... Let's turn there. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Peace. You know, one way you know when your mind is controlled by the spirit man in you, is you have peace. Peace in the mind. Many believers today have turmoil and confusion and all sorts of things that are opposed to peace going on in their mind. He says in verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, praise, think on these things. Now, what he's talking about there is controlled thinking. There are some things that we have no business thinking about, and there are other things that we must purpose to have going on within our thought life. Now, Paul would, I tell you, he would have missed it if we didn't have the capacity to do what he said to do. He said, think on these things. Now, when you're thinking on these things, nothing's going to hurt you. No booger's going to get you. No demon's going to control you. No demon is going to work his way into your mind when your mind is already filled with the things of God. The scripture talks about once you get delivered, you've got to fill the house. Well, if you get delivered from things that have tormented you in your mind, you've got to fill this mind with the things of God. If your mind is preoccupied with the things of God, then the things that the devil wants to throw in your mind, there's no more room. The house is already filled. I've had people say, well, I got delivered and I still had lustful thoughts. What's the matter with me? How come deliverance didn't work for me? That doesn't mean the devil's not going to fire a dart at you. But you can have victory over the dark. You don't entertain. You don't receive. You don't begin to relish and enjoy those negative things that begin to work against the spirit man within you. When you get aware of the operation of the spirit man within you, you're going to be jealous and zealous to guard the operation of that spirit man. You're going to find out that other things begin to come in and begins to take the spiritual edge off of your life. 
there is a diminishing of the power and the operation of that spirit man within you. And you don't want that. So you get that thing out of your life. All right? So he's talking about controlled thinking, which is necessary, he says, to having a peaceful mind. Now, the second step in discipline is 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, bringing every thought into captivity. Challenge one by one every disturbing thought, everything that is not in accordance with the Word of God, everything that says, well, here is something better than what God said. See, that's every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. See, that's like when the devil came to Eve in the Garden of Eden, and God had said, you can eat of all the fruit except the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat that. The day that you eat it, it'll die. You'll die. And the devil said, well, I got something better than that. You can eat it, and it won't hurt you. In fact, it'll help you. So she received into her mind a thought that was exalted above what God had said. Anytime we get into the realm of operation, thinking that we are wiser than God and wiser than the counsel of the Word of God, then we are on the banana peeling. Now, renewing the mind is a battle. We must fight this battle with spiritual weapons. Notice he says in this context that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. And he talks then about the reasonings, the imaginations that are within the mind. Saints, he's talking about something that has already been established in the mind. You're pulling down something that has already been lifted up and exalted. You are dealing with those areas of your mind where Satan has already done the work, where there is already an entrenchment within your life. And he says that you use spiritual weapons to pull down the strongholds of Satan and to get victory in your mind. In Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3. Let's turn there. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. For the discipline of my, our minds, we must keep our minds stayed on God. God has to become the foremost thing in our thinking. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy what? Heart. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy what? Heart. All thy mind? Yes. Thy soul and thy strength. Notice he included the mind. You have to love the Lord with all your mind. You remember when you were in love with somebody? You just think about them once in a while? And some of you looking like, I can't remember that far back. You remember, you remember when you had that love and that person was on your mind night and day, continuously on your mind. God said, I want you to love me like that. I want you to have me forever in your thoughts, continually upon your mind. So our minds must be stayed upon the Lord. In Second Peter chapter 3, here's another principle of the discipline of our minds. Verses 1 and 2. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and by the commandment of the apostles and of the Lord and Savior. Now, he says to stir up your minds by way of remembrance. Memory is a very important function of your mind. And within your mind are the facts of the Word of God and the truths of the Word of God. Peter is saying here, I'm coming back and I'm preaching to you and I'm telling you some of the things that I have told you before. But I'm doing that in order to stir up your memory. Now, we need to continue to have stirred up in our memory the things that will minister to us spiritually. The things that will build strength and bring renewal into our minds. It blesses me when I see people taking notes on what's being taught in these meetings. And those notes are not something just to throw on the table or in the wastebasket, but those notes are something to stir up your memory. You might write just a few words, but when you read that, then the essence of what was taught out of the Word of God will come back to you. I love to see people get the tapes of the teachings that have gone forth. Not to just go home and throw them in a box and forget about them but to put them in that tape machine and play those tapes back and hear that truth again and stir up the memory of the truths of God. See, this is one way to keep the mind 
in the things of God and in the way of God. This is a disciplinary process for the mind. If your mind is occupied with those things, meditate upon the Word of God day and night. Then it says in 1 Peter 1.13 that we are to gird up the loins of our mind. You know, that's an analogy from the natural. The girding up of the loins. If a fellow was going to run a race, he couldn't run it with a long robe on. And so he would gird up his loins. He would pull up those loose ends of that rope and tie them around his waist. So his legs would be free and he'd be free to run. It says in Hebrews 12 that we are to lay aside all of those weights that hinder us. We have to gird up the loins of our minds. Those loose ends in our mind that are going to trip us up. Sometimes we have a lot of loose ends going along in our mind. And those are the things that will defeat us. Those are the things that will trip us up. He says, gird up the loins of your mind. You know, the loins are spoken of in the scripture as the reproductive area of a person's body. Even a long time before the Aaronic priesthood came forth, the scripture says that Levi was present in the loins of Abraham. He was present in the loins of Abraham. Now, when he talks about See, in our minds, our minds are capable of bringing forth that which will bring life and that which will bring ministry. And he's saying that we have to gird up. Don't just let your mind just receive anything. You know, we talk about a loose person, a loose man. If a man is loose morally, he's liable to have children scattered all over everywhere, born to him by a variety of different women. See, he hasn't girded up his loins. Now, God says, gird up the loins of your mind. All of those loose ends. Don't be a loose-minded person. Just bringing forth all kinds of things spread around everywhere. All right, again in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, another step in discipline of our mind is the protection of our mind. Here's where it talks about putting on the helmet of salvation, which is the hope of salvation. What is hope? Let me give you a good off-the-cuff definition of hope. Hope is the confident expectation of good. You realize how that protects your mind? To put on the helmet, which is the hope of salvation. Now, remember the word salvation is the same as the word for deliverance. To put on that helmet, which is the hope of your deliverance. Now, the devil's not going to be able to get into that mind when it is so protected. It'll not be filled with pessimism. It'll not be filled with faithless faithless thoughts that'll come like wild birds just to roost in your brain. Glory to God. Have a disciplined mind. Again, in Romans chapter 12, the first two verses, he says there is a price to pay to have a renewed mind, that you may present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You can have a disciplined mind. It's going to cost you something. You know what it's going to cost you? Just cost you your life. That's all. Just lay your life on the altar for God. Refuse to be conformed to this world, the world's no longer dictating to you what you believe and what you do. Peer pressure doesn't phase you. Worldly trends don't entice you. You have just one guideline, and that's the Lord and the Word of the Lord, renewed by the Word of God. See, that requires a death to self. See, if you can't have it your way any longer, I'm living unto the Lord. So we can't have discipline mind. Is your hand disciplined? Did you ever see anybody's hand and it just goes on bang some... You know, bang them in the head, you know. Just kept slapping them in the head. And I wish you wouldn't do that. Why do you keep hitting me that way? That hurts. Don't do that. You can control that hand. You can keep that hand from hitting you in the head. Do you know that your mind is a part of you just as much as your hand is a part of you? If you can keep your hand from hitting your head, you can control your mind as well. And God wants your mind to be controlled. Now, can you bear with me just a little longer? I want to give you the, some of the symptoms of the carnal mind. Some of the symptoms of the mind that is controlled by evil spirits. You want to write these down. Nine evidences of minds controlled by the evil spirits. I'll just kind of give these to you without trying to elaborate too much on them because I want us to save some time for ministry. The first evidence that evil spirits are at work in the mind is when the mind is tormented. When the peace of the mind is disturbed or that peace may be actually destroyed. See, peace is related to the operation of the mind. God says he will keep in perfect peace that one whose mind is stayed upon him. 
for he trusteth in God. Now, peace is lost when we're not resting and trusting in God. And the tormented mind is filled with things like fear, anxiety, discontent, worry, condemnation, things like that. I'm sure none of you here are tormented over anything that's going on in your family. The operation of the enemy is evidenced when our minds are in turmoil. Our minds are in torment. Our minds are filled with anxiety. What's going to happen to my children? Oh, my. What's going to happen to my husband and my wife? What's going to become of us financially? What if I lose my job? See, when we get out of the position of trust and confidence in God, fear is going to come right in. Have you noticed that when you're trusted in God, you can't be afraid? But when you're not trusting in God, you're prone to fear. And your mind is opened up as an invitation to the devil. Well, just come on and get me. Just come on and get me. Just chew me up and spit me out. And he'll do that if he gets the chance. He'll move right on in. Another symptom of a mind controlled by evil spirits is a polluted mind. Filled with impure thoughts. Filled with lustful fantasies. You know, a lot of the the things that come into our minds come in through our eyes. They come in through our ears. We have gates where things come into our eyes. You know, I'm getting more and more convinced how many evil spirits come into people through watching television. I mean, it's, it's something. They just come right out of that set, right into that person. Because there's things on there that we should never permit our eyes to see. If you can't control that off and on knob on your television and turn it off with something evil, something lustful, something that's going to minister to you and tear down that spirit man, you better throw that whole thing out. If you can't control it, it's better not to have it. Because a lot of those things come in through the eye gate. A lot of people lose their peace. I find little children that are disturbed. They're tormented. They're filled with fears and anxieties. And you know, I found out that a lot of that came to them when they were watching the Saturday morning cartoons on, on television. Those things were having the little characters on there, their little friends, they were having them splattered and sawn asunder and stretched on the rack and everything else. And those little kids don't know the difference between reality and unreality. And they look at there what's happening. And I've watched some children. I just made it a policy one time just to watch some children that were watching those cartoons. And they were sitting there and they were shaking and all the color drained out of their face. And they were filled with fear and they were filled with worry. And they were wide open for those spirits to come into them. We're delivering children from a lot of spirits like this that came in to disturb them. Well, that not only happens to children, but it happens to a lot of people. As adults, the mind becomes polluted. Another thing that is indicative of the operation of of unclean spirits, evil spirits, is when our minds are given over to fantasy. Given over to fantasy. You know, the world has programmed us as Christians to think that we've got to have fantasy. You just can't live without fantasy. Most fantasy is a form of escapism. You know, we don't have to bring up our children in fairy lands, in fantasy. Bring them up in reality. There is nothing in the Word of God that is fantasy. Everything in the Word of God is reality. See, the word truth in the Scripture is really the word for reality. Everything in the word, everything that God gives to us is reality. He does not use fantasy in the Word of God as a vehicle for conveying truth. They are opposed to one another. I've seen enough to know that demons take advantage of fantasy. Now, we have people that get into acting and they get into drama and they get into a lot of things like that. And they, they're, they're promoting, mostly in that, they're promoting fantasy and unreality. If somebody plays the part of somebody, they are pretending that they are somebody other than who they are. That's the reason the scripture, the word hypocrite, is a play actor. And a person who becomes a play actor, he must become like that person that he's trying to portray and he invites spirits of that nature into himself. And he takes on demons that give him multiple personalities. Fantasy is dangerous. Daydreaming is dangerous. Vivid imaginations and unrealities of the mind are dangerous as those things are used as methods of escapism. So beware of the fantasy mind. Another characteristic of the mind beset by evil spirits is the evil mind. Now there are all kinds of degrees of the evil mind. It may be a criminal mind. We minister to people. They just plot crimes. They just try to think up new ways of doing sadistic things. But an evil mind can also be a mind that is filled with resentment, filled with hatred, 
filled with bitterness and retaliation. Another characteristic of a mind controlled by evil spirits is the worldly mind, preoccupied with the cares of this world, preoccupied with philosophies, humanism, preoccupied by worldly fads and fashions and activities. We're trying to help some of our young people in our church back at home. I noticed when I was home the last three weeks, some of our young people, you know, just coming into those early teenage years, and they have gotten so caught up in the things of the world. You know, it's so dreadfully important to them, the name that's on the hip pocket of their blue jeans. Well, I couldn't be seen in public unless I have that certain name on my hip pocket. Oh, God forbid. See, we get caught up into the fads, into the thinkings, and into the ways of the world. And we become worldly-minded, and we become controlled by the world. We've got to act like the world, and behave like the world, and smell like the world. That's the reason God says, be not conformed to this world. Because it's the people who are conformed to this world that the door is open for the evil spirits to come in, and to control them, and to possess them. Another characteristic is the mind that is filled with self-awareness. My problem. My needs, my hurts, my feelings, my comfort. You know, a person who is preoccupied by himself is in a prison house, all bound up in himself. Another characteristic of the mind that is beset by evil spirits is the hindered mind, where there is confusion, forgetfulness, especially when one is hindered in spiritual pursuits. Try to read the Bible. Oh, I can read the newspaper, the Reader's Digest. No problem at all. Try to read the Bible. Just can't understand anything. Didn't receive a thing. Mind just went blank. Mind began to wander. Mind began to be confused. Mind to be hindered and bound. Boy, that shows the work of the devil. Anytime you're trying to involve yourself in spiritual things and your mind won't cooperate, that is a mind that is beset by the power of evil spirit. I had that for a long time. I had that from the time that I started preaching up about 25 years of my ministry. Well, not quite that many, about 20 years of my ministry. I had a bound mind. Every time I tried to read the Word of God, it was like my mind was in a vice and it wouldn't work. Can you imagine trying to preach and prepare at least three sermons a week? And every time you tried to study the Word of God, nothing would happen up here. A lot of times I was up at three or four o'clock on Sunday mornings still trying to find something to preach for Sunday. And boy, when Sunday night was over, I said, praise God, that one's gone. That week's over. Dreading the next one. Oh, boy, here comes another. Got to have three more sermons. And that old mind was in a vice. Well, there were some reasons for it. Some ways that I had opened myself up to the powers of the devil by attending a spiritist meeting and things like that, where that binding came into my mind. But praise God, through deliverance, all of that left me. Thank you, Jesus. All that hindrance to my mind. Another indication of the operation of spirits in your mind is the pressured mind. The mind just races, it just thinks, it just thinks, it just thinks. It just won't shut off. You go to bed at night and it just keeps going and going and going. That's another one I had for many years. Oh, how oh, it's so wonderful just to lie down and go to sleep at night. My mind would go over and it'd think, well, now, what did I say? I said the wrong thing. I should have said this instead of that. And the mind just goes on and it says, they said this to me. Why did they say that to me? And I'd be analyzing and my mind go, just turning, turning, turning all night long. See, that's not God. God doesn't want you to be distraught in your mind. He doesn't want you to be disturbed. He doesn't want your peace to be wrecked. Some people don't even know what it is to have a calm mind. They, they've never had If they made it in the middle of the road, they wouldn't even recognize it because all their life, all that stuff, they think, well, that's just normal Christian living. Say, that's not normal Christian living. That's the oppression of the devil. God wants your mind to be free from all of that pressure. Glory to God. Can you see that the devil makes your mind a target? Another thing that the scripture talks about of the tormented mind is the double-minded man. James 1.8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. See, the double-minded man is the one who can't stand in faith. He's like the waves of the sea and he's tossed to and fro. And he says, let not this man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. He can't stand in one position. He starts out one way and then he changes courses and he goes this way and he's back and forth. He's just moved by whatever comes along. That's the double-minded man. He can't make a decision and stick with it. That was another problem. Folks, I've come out of most of these problems that I'm sharing with you today. Most of them I had in my own life. I am thankful for what the Lord has done for my mind. I was so double-minded I couldn't make the, a decision about the simplest thing in my life. I'd get up in the morning and try to decide, well, what am I going to do first? And so I'd start, and I'd say, well, i go, no, maybe I should. Maybe it'd be better, you know. And I'd just go around and around, heading off in ten directions at one time. That's torment. That's terrible. 
I got deliverance from spirits of double-mindedness, and then I had to learn to discipline my mind. I'd make a decision, and then a thought would come, well, maybe you should do I said, devil, I'm not going to do anything else. I'm going to do the first thing, and I'm going to press through, and I'm going to finish it. And so I had to discipline my mind to do that single thing that I knew that I should do without getting all confused and trying to start six different projects at one time and not knowing which one of them to take hold of next. Well, have any of you identified with anything pertaining to the mind? <laughs> I've kind of gone through that. I thought maybe we might scare up a few boogers. Are you ready to be set free from the bondage of the mind? God says be set free from the bondages of the mind. Be set free. You came here to be set free. God wants you to be set free. And he wants you to be set free now from all the bondages on your mind. Would you stand? You ready to take a stretch? I like to teach like that because I see those old devils just saying, "Uh uh-oh, they done found me out. How many of you are here in this service and deliverance ministry is more or less new to you? You haven't been around it, been exposed to it? All right, we got quite a few. Now, you see, most of the ones here have been involved in deliverance. And the very fact that they are here today is is evidence that they survived it. And knowing this is a deliverance camp, they came back for some more of it because it was good. Now, if this is new to you, it'll be a learning experience for you. So you, you, you can learn today, but we want you to participate. Let's have participation rather than spectatorship. Let me, let me give you some brief instructions about what we're going to do. We're going to be ministering to deliverance to everybody here at the same time. And we're going to call the spirits out by spiritual authority as the Lord shows us, as the Lord leads us. When we command that spirit to leave you, it must come out. When you've met God's conditions, that spirit must go out of you. Now, most of the time when spirits come out, they come out through the breath. They come out through the mouth or they come out through the nose. Now, the reason for that is that the word spirit in the scripture is exactly the same as the word for breath. So, spirit and breath are equated in the Word of God. Even the Holy Spirit, Jesus, breathed upon his disciples and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. So, breath manifestation. Sometimes there will be definite marked manifestations when evil spirits leave us. Now, through the breath, sometimes there are spirits that cause people to yawn. There may be a series of yawns. Spirits will come out through those yawning. As the people, sometimes spirits come out where they're just more like a sigh. You just feel like a little heaviness there, and that spirit just breathes out just very simply and easily. Now, remember, spirits are unclean spirits, and we can't always expect them to behave like gentlemen. Sometimes when spirits come out, they cause people to burp, just a plain old belch. Now, if you belch during deliverance, you don't have to ask others around you to excuse you. All you do is know that an evil spirit is gone, and you just say, praise the Lord. Now, sometimes... Spirits do come out crying. They'll cause the person to weep and to cry, or sometimes they come out crying in loud voices. I don't know whether that'll happen here today, but if it should, you'll know it's not the person crying, but it's the evil spirit crying and coming out. The reason he's crying, he's lost his house. He's being evicted, and he doesn't know what's going to happen to him next. He's going to have to go back and report to his superior that he failed, and he's not anticipating the joy of what his... Uh, a superior is going to say to him when he failed to accomplish his mission. So they cry when they leave because they are very, very unhappy. Evidently, it's no picnic to have to walk through dry places. So the spirits will manifest. Now, sometimes during deliverance, people feel sensations in their bodies. You may feel sensations in your hands. It's very common for people to feel sensations like tingling or numbness. Sometimes the fingers even become strutted and the thumb turned in. And it's impossible that first person for a little while to bend his fingers. Now, those are just manifestations that we see sometimes when people are being delivered of evil spirits. But don't be distracted or diverted in your attention from manifestations. Now, some people get disappointed because they didn't have a manifestation. Well, there was somebody else and the demon threw them in the floor and they were wigging them like a snake. And I didn't feel anything. You don't have to feel anything. The evidence of deliverance is not judged by manifestation nor the degree of manifestation. If you have faith and you believe God and meet God's conditions, when those spirits are commanded to go, they must go in the name of Jesus. So we're believing God for the deliverance that you need this day. Now, since they come out through breath, it is very helpful to push those spirits out, to expel those spirits. 
When you command the Spirit to come out, it has to begin to move to come out. And as it begins to move up and come out through your mouth or your nose, you can help by pushing your breath out to push that Spirit out. And many times, something other than a mere breath will take place by way of a manifestation. But that Spirit will go. That's a way to activate your will, to exercise your faith, and to set yourself against those powers within you. They must come out. Now, we keep pushing them, keep commanding them. They will come out. But when we're in a group ministry, the most effective way to do it is to have the people just take a deep breath every time we call a Spirit out and say, You Spirit, now you're gone in the name of Jesus. Well, I see some of you manifested already. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The light's setting you free. The light's setting you free. I want to lead you in a prayer. There are some things that will hinder your deliverance. There, were, there are a few things that will even block your deliverance. And I want to lead you in a prayer and a confession to meet God's condition. Now, you, you repeat these things after me with all of your heart, especially any unforgiveness that you have towards anyone, dead or alive. No matter what they did, you forgive them. The scripture is plain in Matthew 18. If you have bitterness, unresolved uh, forgiveness in your heart against anyone, that you are turned over to the tormentors. You're turned over to the power of evil spirits to harass you and torment you until you forgive everyone who's ever trespassed against you. So you meet that condition. And let God know that you are standing with him, that you are through with the devil and his works and his kingdom. And you've planted your feet in the kingdom of God, and you're intending to live for the Lord. And the devil knows that when you take that position. And he has to leave you in the power of Jesus' name. Saints, this is an important time. Some of you have waited a long time for this. Some of you here could give long testimonies of the fruits of the deliverances that you've already received. I thank God for the deliverance that I've received. I was such a tormented person. My mind was so tormented, so beset by the enemy. But I have a peaceful mind now. I have a mind that's in rest. And it came about because I, I received deliverance from the power of those spirits. And, and because my mind has been disciplined and my mind has been renewed in the things of God. And I want you, I want every one of you to have what the Lord has given to me. And what I've seen come into the lives of so many others. I want you to have it today. Claim it in the name of Jesus. Know that it's yours. Every bondage, every shackle upon our minds is broken today. The chains of bondage and darkness are broken today in the name of Jesus. Say this with me. Lord Jesus, you have died on the cross for my sins. And you rose again from the dead. I have trusted in you to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me by your blood. You are my Savior and you are my Lord. I want to serve you. I want to live for you. You know all of my sins, but I repent of each one. I ask you to forgive me. And Lord, I receive your forgiveness. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me for all of my sins. Because, Lord, I forgive others who have trespassed against me. Those that have hurt me. Those who have wounded me. Those who have rejected me. Those who have offended me. I forgive them now. I bless them. And with your help, I love them. Lord, I forgive myself. Lord, I call upon you. You've promised in your word, whoever calls upon you shall be delivered. I call upon you now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver me and set me free. I submit my mind to you. I have the mind of Christ. Everything that opposes my mind, that torments my mind, that pollutes my mind, or hinders my mind from being in the kingdom of God, I fall out of agreement with it. And I take back all of the ground that I've ever yielded to the devil in my thoughts and in my mind. Satan, you have no right to me. 
You have no power over me. And I command you to leave me. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, this is so important. What God is about to do in His precious name. By His precious blood. The spirits of torment. The spirits of fear. They're spirits of fear. God says fear hath torment. Some of your minds have been tormented. There are all kinds of fears. Fears of the future. Fears of failure. Family-related fears. Financial-related fears. Say this with me. In the name of Jesus, I renounce every spirit of fear. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. Every spirit of fear, I command you now, in the name of Jesus, go. Now just take a deep breath. Let it go. In the name of Jesus. Spirits of fear, spirits of fear, I command you to go. You will leave now in the name of Jesus. 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 The fears of exposure. The fears of being exposed because of past sins in your life, which are covered and atoned for by the precious blood of Jesus. I command all of those fears. What if they knew? What if they knew? What if they knew what I'd done? I command those spirits of fear. You must go now in the name of Jesus. You must get out of our minds. I command you torment. You torment. Go now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The fear of failure. The fear of failure. The fear of failure. Failing as a person. Failing as a Christian. In the name of Jesus. Failing on the job. Fears of failure. Fears of failing your family. I command you to go in Jesus' name. You go now in the name of the Lord. That's right. Keep coming out. Keep coming out. In the name of Jesus. You spirits that oppress our minds with fear and with torment. With torment in the name of Jesus. You night tormentors that trouble our minds at night. Fill our minds with fear in the name of Jesus. Night troublers. Night troublers that torment our minds in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God says there's some of you that hear voices in your mind. Those evil spirits talking to your mind. I rebuke those many voices. I command them to come out of our minds now. In the name of Jesus. Saints, enter in. Every time I call for a spirit, you reject it. You renounce it in your own heart. Take a breath and let it go out of you. Be set free from the torment. Challenge these spirits. Believe in the name of Jesus. You're delivered. They're going out. They're going out all over this room. In the name of Jesus. Every spirit of mental oppression, we command you, go now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Spirits of mental illness. Mental illness. Insanity. I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Mental spirits. Mental insanity. And fear of mental insanity. Fear of breakdown. Fear of being hospitalized. Fear of shock treatments. Fear of drug treatments. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You tormented and oppressed mind spirits. I command you to go now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And the devil says, yeah, but somebody else in your family has it. And it's in your blood. You've inherited it. And you're going to be mentally ill. That's the lie of the devil. God has chosen our inheritance for us. We have an inheritance of life and peace in the Lord. We have the mind of Christ. Jesus Christ is not mentally ill. And He does not give us, as His children, mental illness. But He restores us. He restores us in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of mental anguish, mental anguish and mental torment, I command you to go. Mental oppressing spirits, more night troublers. There are more night troublers in the name of Jesus. We command you to go in Jesus' name. Go in Jesus' name. That's right. All over this house. All over this house. You will leave now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Every spirit of polluted mind. Polluted mind spirits. Spirits of fantasy lust. Spirits of fantasy lust. I command you to go. Polluted by evil thoughts and wicked thoughts and unclean thoughts. We command all of you unclean thought spirits, we command you to go now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on out. Come on out. That's right, tormentors. Come on out. Keep going in the name of Jesus. Keep going now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Keep going now in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of oppressed mind, I command you to go now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You must go. All the spirits of fantasy and unreality, I command you to go. 
fantasy escapism. I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Fantasy daydreaming. I command you to go in the name of Jesus. You're an enemy of truth. You're an enemy of reality. And I command you to leave us now. Keep going now in the name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is against you, enemy. The blood of Jesus is against you. We command every one of you to go in the power of Jesus' name. Every one of you must leave us tonight in the name of Jesus. You must go. You must go. Every spirit of double-mindedness. 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 Come on out, all you schizophrenic spirits. The spirits of doubt in the mind. Doubt and disbelief. Unbelief. The questioning. The reasoning. I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Indecision. Indecision and confusion. I command you to go. In the name of Jesus. That's right. Confusion. Mental confusion. I command you to go. Mental confusion. You must go now. In the name of Jesus. Mental confusion. Mental confusion. Confusion of mind. Confusion of mind. You old mind muddling spirits. You old mind muddling spirit. I command every one of you to leave. In the power of Jesus name. In the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Whosoever calls upon His name shall be delivered. Our bodies are the temples of God's Holy Spirit. Our minds belong to the Lord. And you can't have them, enemy. You can't harass them. You can't oppress them. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The spirits of forgetfulness. Forgetfulness. I command you to go. Forgetfulness. Just take it right out of our mind. In the name of Jesus. Hindered mind spirits. Hindered mind spirits. I command you to go. Hindered. Hindered and confused and forgetfulness, I command you to go. You leave us tonight. You leave us now in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I command all those spirits of tired mindedness, I command you to go now in the name of Jesus. Tiredness and weariness, fading of the mind, fading of the mind. Hallelujah. The Lord says that we're not to faint in our mind. We're not to faint. We're to stand strong in faith. Stand strong in faith. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, stand in the promise of God, stand in the trust of God. Some of you have been believing God a long time for some of His promises to be fulfilled. And your mind's beginning to get weary, begin to entertain doubts and fears. We command all of that to go in the name of Jesus. All of that must go in the name of Jesus. Intellectualism that wants to rise to the throne and exalt its mind against the things of the Spirit of God. We command you to go. Intellectualism and intellectual pride. I command you mental spirits. Mental spirits in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. That's right. All the spirits of logic and reasoning that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. You must go now. You must leave now in the power of Jesus' name. Some of you have oppression in your minds because of occult activities that you were involved in. Renounce those occult things that you were involved in. Ask the Lord to forgive you and free your mind. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We break those occult yokes that bind the mind. That's right. Spirits of mind control. Mind control. ESP. ESP. Hypnotism. Those spirits that came in because of hypnotism. I command to go in the name of Jesus. Mind control. Mind control. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I command to go now. Go now. The spirits that came in through oriental meditation, through transcendental meditation, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. There are spirits that came in through rock music, through rock music that have affected the mind in the name of Jesus. And I command those spirits to go now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. That's right, you demonic spirits that have come in to take control and to oppress our minds. We command you to go now in Jesus' name. The blood of Jesus is against you. Drug-related spirits, tranquilizers, and other drug-related spirits, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Drug oppression spirits, I command you to go. Leave us now in the name of Jesus. Leave us now in the name of Jesus. Leave us now in the name of Jesus. Come on out. Come on out. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. That's right. Keep going. Keep going now. In the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus prevails. The blood of Jesus prevails. We command you to leave now. In the name of the Lord. Everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. 
is pulled down out of our lives. In the name of Jesus, you anti-faith spirits, we command you to go. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And more of you lustful thought spirits, that I command you to go. Spirits of mental lust. Mental lust, I command you to go. Now, in the name of Jesus. You go now, in the name of Jesus. Spirits of mental lust, I command you to go. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. There are more fears. Fears of the future. Fears of the future. What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family? In the name of Jesus. Fears of the future. Fears of the future. I command you to go. Fears of sickness. Fears of sickness. Fears of death. Fears of death. I command you to go. Fears of accident. Fears of hospital. Fears of surgery. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the stripes of Jesus by which we're healed. I thank you, Lord, for the power that's in your name and the power that's in your blood. I thank you, Lord, for setting the captives free. Thank you, Lord, for setting our feet upon a rock and establishing us in all our ways. Thank you, Lord, that the power of the enemy is broken. Every oppressor is cast down. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, that our minds are liberated. Our minds are set free. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Glory, hallelujah. Glory to the name of the Lord. Praise and magnify the name of Jesus. There's some brain damage spirits that need to go now. Brain damage. Some of you had licks on your head. The things that happened and your brain was damaged. Some of you had brain damage through shock treatments. In the name of Jesus, command every spirit that came in through shock, shock therapy. I command you to go in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, brain damage. Brain damage, I command you to go. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Every spirit of brain damage, I command you to go. In Jesus' name. Every spirit of mental retardation. Every slow learning spirit. Every hindrance to learning. Hindrance to learning, I command you to go. Hindrance to learning. Hindrance to memory. I command you to go in the name of Jesus. I command you to leave us now in the name of Jesus. You distracted mind spirits that distract us from the things of God. When we try to meditate upon the Word of God, you spirits of distraction, you spirits of mental distraction, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Go now. Go now in the name of Jesus. Go now. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All of you worldly mind spirits, I command you to go. Worldly mind spirits, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Worldly mind, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, worldly mind, I command you to go. In the name of Jesus, we're not programmed and conformed to this world, but we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. Transformed by the renewing of our minds. Reprobate mind spirits. Reprobate mind spirits, I command you to go. I command you to go. When in time past, we invited in that old reprobate mind spirit, I command you to leave us now. In the name of Jesus. Reprobate mind, you old devils that are a, a companion to perverseness and homosexuality and lesbianism, I command you to go, you perverted mind spirit. Perver perverted mind spirits, I command you to go. That's right, I command you to leave us. Reprobate mind, reprobate mind, I command you to go from us and leave us now. In the name of Jesus. All those spirits of doubt, doubt and unbelief that flood the mind, all those spirits of doubt that would come and say, you didn't receive anything, you didn't get any deliverance, nothing happened, nothing happened, you lying, deceiving spirits of doubt and unbelief, we command you to go in the name of Jesus. We command you to go in the name of Jesus. That's right. Some of you still finishing up your deliverance. That's all right. Just keep on home for a few minutes. Praise and worship the Lord. Just praise and worship the Lord and give thanks unto Him. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.